You're listening to the Sermon Podcast for the Peak Church, located in Apex, North Carolina. Our church is striving to welcome all who are feeling disconnected from God. And so our hope is that over the next several minutes, you will connect with the God that we are talking about, and you'll resonate deeply with the life that this God wants for you. We hope you enjoy. scripture passage for today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 7 through 15. When you pray, don't pour out a flood of empty words, as the Gentiles do. They think that by saying many words, they'll be heard. Don't be like them, because your Father knows what you need before you ask. Pray like this. Our Father, who is in heaven, uphold the holiness of your name. Bring in your kingdom, so that your will is done on earth as it's done in heaven. Give us the bread we need for today. Forgive us for the ways we have wronged you, just as we also forgive those who have wronged us. And don't lead us into temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. If you forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others, neither, neither will your Father forgive your sins. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning again, friends, to those of you who are here in person and online. Welcome back for another week of our sermon series that we started just after Easter called Risky Prayers. Risky Prayers. If you're just joining us for the very first time here today, for the last several weeks, what we've been doing is we've been exploring our own prayer life. And specifically, we've been asking the question of how often do we mean what we pray and pray what we mean. This is an interesting thing to think about, at least for my own life, because uh, it's really tempting. It's really, really tempting to make these grand requests of God, to make these great, great uh, asks of God, or perhaps to make a big declaration to God with little to no intention of actually ever following through with the very thing that you've just yammered on to God about, at least for me. And so, for example, the last several weeks we've been talking about uh, what does it mean to pray prayers like, God, let your will be done. Prayers like, uh, God, teach me, reveal to me what is true, what is real. Last week we talked about what does it mean, what are the implications, what are the consequences of praying a prayer of, God, give me today my daily bread. I trust you, I rely upon you, I depend upon your provision. The goal of this whole sermon series is to make sure that prayer is not just one of those performative things that we do, but it's actually something you and I mean, that we believe that it makes a difference, and that I got a responsibility in it. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to pick up this conversation. We're going to keep the conversation going by uh, sort of continuing this mini-series within the larger sermon series. I shared last week that last week, this week, and next week, we're actually uh, delving into Jesus' prayer life. And we're seeing how and in what ways did Jesus pray and teach us to pray. And so we're in a mini-series within the broader series on the Lord's Prayer. What does it mean? What are the implications? What are the consequences if you pray the Lord's Prayer, and we do that every week here, right? So you probably know a little bit something about what actually we're asking for. And so last week, we talked about, again, I mentioned earlier, uh, what does it mean? What are the implications? What are the consequences? What are the risks to praying the prayer, God, give us today our daily bread? Today, we're moving to the next major petition, because the next major request that we make of God, at least here at the peak, week after week, is this one. Forgive us as we forgive. 
what are the consequences, what are the implications if you dare to pray this prayer? Forgive us as we forgive. Let's dive in. So if you have your Bibles with you or your smart devices and you want to follow along with our scripture passage for today, today we're going to be camped out once again, same passage as last week, Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 through 15. And I want to give you a little bit of context as to how Jesus sets this up. I love this. Because Jesus is in the midst of a sermon. He's in the midst of a sermon that went in all these different directions. And when he starts to talk about prayer, this is how he starts his dialogue on prayer. He says, be very careful when you pray. Don't be like hypocrites. So when one can assume that everything Jesus is about to say after that are things that we love to say, but ain't nobody like to do. Everything that's about to come out of Jesus' mouth are things that we love to believe, but struggle to follow through with, to act upon, to embody, to imitate in the world. And so in the case of forgiveness, forgiveness is one of those things. I don't know if this is true of your life, but forgiveness is one of those things that we're so fast to ask for. I'm so fast to expect and request forgiveness of other people. But when it's asked of me, I don't know about that, right? Forgiveness is one of those things that, again, I believe I'm always worthy of second chances. I believe I'm always worthy of giving the benefit of the doubt. But when you are telling me that I have to do it for that person over there who's just wronged me, I don't know about it. By the way, this is me every single time I go through the self-checkout line, okay? Let's do a quick poll. How many of you are regular liners? You just go through the line where someone else does the the scanning and such for you? How many of you are self-checkout people? Okay. All right. So those of you who are self-checkout people, you know that there's an art to this, right? There's a training procedure that you go through to make sure. I make sure I'm a pro. When I go through the self-checkout line, I'm going through, I'm an Enneagram 3, so I'm going through with the objective to set records, baby. I'm not there to shop. I'm there to set records. I want the manager to come out and congratulate me on the fastest checkout that has ever happened in the history of Target. And so when I go through, I'm humming. This is a business endeavor. And so I'm there. I'm throwing things through. I'm throwing things through. I've memorized some of the produce numbers, and so I could just sort of speed the process through. I'm going through so fast that I have time to help other people who are struggling. I walk over. You don't know that code? Here we go. That's what it is. You actually have to go through this first, have your ID ready because that's an alcohol purchase, no judgment. Anyway, so I keep scanning through. I keep throwing it through. And what happens is I've become so good at it that if I go through the line and I observe you're struggling, I judge you. I judge you. And there's always these people who are going through and they, never, they have like an artichoke or some random produce. And they're just like, I don't know. Help, what's happening? And I get frustrated because you didn't go through the proper training. Okay, you didn't take this seriously enough. Until it happened to me. <laughs> True story, two weeks ago. So again, I'm right there. I'm throwing these items through. I'm just landing them in the bag perfectly. Boop, boop, team member on the way. That's okay, that's okay, I've been trained for this. I'll reserve it quickly, I'll resolve it quickly and so the people behind me will be fine. The the, the worker can't figure it out, so they have to bring the manager out. The manager can't figure it out. And so they have to do the walk of shame uh, and self-checkout, you know where they go, we're gonna have to take you to a special register over here. And so they take all of your belongings, you hold all of your belongings and you just walk past all these people (laughs) with utter shame and embarrassment and they're judging you, they're mad at you, you've inconvenienced them, the workers are mad at you because you pulled them over from whatever it is that they were doing. And I'm so ticked as I'm walking over there because I'm like, why is no one showing me grace and compassion? Why is no one forgiving? Oh. Here in this moment, what Jesus is doing is he's calling us out on all of the double standards that we love to project upon other people. And it's precisely why during the Lord's Prayer, he instructs us that when it comes to forgiveness, this is how you have to pray. If you dare to ask for forgiveness, you better be prepared to give it. Forgive us for the ways we have wronged you, just as those two words, most important in the entire verse, just as we also forgive those who have wronged us. 
Those two words highlight for you, highlight for me, that the only forgiveness that Jesus is interested in is reciprocal forgiveness. It's a forgiveness that, again, if you dare to ask for it, you better be prepared to administer it, whether that person is deserving of it or not, right? And so what Jesus is doing here, I would argue, is he's not only teaching the year, but he teaches this in several places, right? He teaches this very principle in several places. Fast forward just one chapter in Matthew chapter 7. He teaches this very same concept. Don't judge so that you won't be judged. You'll receive the same judgment you give. Whatever you deal out will be dealt out to you. This is one of the places where there's no ambiguity. Jesus is super clear here that if you expect grace and compassion, the first question out of God's mouth is going to be, where and how have you administered and given to others? And friends, in so doing, I would argue that Jesus is not only making a really challenging request of us, but he's inviting us into an entirely different world than the world in which we are currently living in. He's inviting us into a world that is not based off of idealism, but realism. Idealism is that little voice in your head that says, that, that says should. Oh, well, they should have treated me this way. I should have gotten that. It should have unfolded this way. Jesus is inviting you out of that world and into the world of realism that, guess what? You live with imperfect people. You yourself are imperfect. This is going to be something you encounter every day. Additionally, Jesus invites us out of this world that is so quick. We live in a world that's so quick that if you harm me, you offend me, you say something I don't agree with, the world tells you divide, separate, sever yourself from that person and get as far away from them as humanly possible. And Jesus is that gentle voice that says, yeah, so I'm actually not doing that. I'm trying to rebuild the world. I'm trying to restore the world. I'm trying to reconcile the world. And so I'm actually going to be the voice inviting you to make peace where it is possible. And so, friends, by preaching this way, by teaching this way, again, Jesus is inviting you and I into an entirely different world, and he's inviting us into an entirely different world knowing full well what the risks would have been for him and what the risks will be for you. And so the question today, the only question that actually matters today is this. Will you follow him into that world? Will you be a part of that new order? Are you willing to accept all the risks that come with living and praying and meaning when you pray? Forgive us as we forgive. Will you do so knowing full well that One of the risks, one of the greatest risks of praying this prayer and meaning this prayer is that you will have to be someone who doesn't hide but owns their mistakes. That's risk number one. You want to mean this prayer? You want to actually follow through with this prayer? One of the risks is that you will have to get in the habit of owning, not hiding your mistakes. You're going to have to start getting really comfortable with awkward conversations when you mess up. Awkward conversations where you own what you have done, you take responsibility for what you have done, instead of uh, gaslighting the other person for being upset with you or uh, masking some version of the situation so that it preserves you from feeling guilty or whitewashing the story altogether so that it gets confusing and no one thinks that you're the one responsible. Instead of all of those things that the world has given you, the tools that the world has given you, you have to be someone who owns those things. Now, that ain't easy. Moreover, it is not fun. I would argue, in fact, that there's two sub-risks to that, that there's two sub-risks to owning instead of hiding from the mistakes that you have made. The first of which is this. If you actually live this way, you're running a huge risk that you're going to damage your image. You will run a huge risk that this will change how people see you, how people perceive you, you. No people group in the world knows this better than parents. We do this with our kids all the time. When we make a mistake with our kids, it's really hard to own it. Why? Because I want my kids to respect me. I want my kids to look up to me. I want my kids to think of the world of me. And so when they make mis- or when I make mistakes, 
when I own those things, I'm jeopardizing how they see me. This happened literally just three days ago. Three days ago, uh, I made a mistake. I made a mistake with one of my children. We were having an argument about screen time, which is where every single war in our entire household comes from. So what happened was, screen time was ending, dinner time was approaching, and so I told both my kids, I said, I need you to finish the level that you're on, finish the level that you're doing right now, and then come eat dinner. One of my children finishes the level two minutes later and is right there at the table. The other one, seven minutes later, still playing the game. So I walk in assuming that this child has started a new level and is just continuing to play. And so what do I do? I scold him, I punish him, I send him to his room. <sighs> 10 minutes later, I go and retrieve the game, I open it up and I find out that he actually didn't do anything wrong. This apparently was just the longest level on planet Earth. <laughs> and so every parent knows that in that moment, you have two choices. Two choices. You can manipulate the facts a little bit to preserve your innocence and come out on top of the argument. Uh, or you can own it. Or you can own it. And here's what I'm finding to be true in my own life. When I don't own it, when I don't take responsibility, two things happen. Number one, I lose their respect because they know. They know they didn't do anything wrong, and they know you're living according to some false picture of what actually happened. So I lose their respect. And secondly, something begins to happen in me. You see, friends, when you live a life and you don't take responsibility for your mistakes, you seek to hide them or whitewash them or whatever, something happens. The internal you and the external you become detached. It looks like this. The internal you, the one that knows the truth, knows what happened, becomes detached from this external you, this, this facade you're trying to protect for other people to see. And here's why that's so unbelievably risky. The more you do that, or the less you take responsibility, this begins to happen. The internal you and the external you begin to drift farther and farther and farther and farther apart. And at best, at best, you become a superficial person. At worst, you forget who the real you actually is. You spend all of your time and energy trying to protect this facade, this image. You actually have no idea who the real you is anymore. And so I can't make this decision for you. This is the question that you have to wrestle with. What is more important to you? Your image or your identity? Now, that's just the first sub-risk. If you decide to actually mean what you pray and own the implications of this prayer, the second sub-risk to owning instead of hiding your mistakes is not only do you run the risk of damaging your image and your reputation, how you come across to other people, you also run the risk of having to take responsibility for the collateral damage that you made possible. In other words, what you will find often is that sometimes when you make mistakes, there are other people who are negatively impacted that you had no idea this was going to be the case. And you actually have to accept responsibility for the implications with them just as much as the one in question. I will never forget this for the rest of my life. Several years ago, someone who does not come to this church somehow got my uh, information off of, all, offline and uh, invited me, said it was an urgent matter, needed to have a private conversation with me. So I sit down with this person, and they share with me in the opening minutes uh, that they have had an extramarital affair. And they asked me, as a pastor, do I believe that God will forgive them for what they have done? Y'all, this job is wild. <laughs> and immediately when this person was sharing this with me and asking me of this question, immediately a story came to mind that came from the Gospels. Jesus says this. Jesus talks about instances like this. He says, uh, there's going to be times when you want to, like if this is the person you've offended, there's going to be times when you want to like 
sort of circumvent them and go right to God and be like, yo, so I messed up, so like, can you forgive me? And we can just sort of pretend this never happened. And Jesus says this. Jesus says, it's like someone coming to an altar with a gift, but they've got beef, they've got issues with a brother or sister. And actually what God's response to that is going to be is to say, hey, I need you to actually get up, leave, go find them, and then come back to me. You see, friends, this is the God you've got. The God you've got in Jesus doesn't allow us to just sort of like find forgiveness in a vacuum or in isolation. It's a forgiveness that requires us to own the collateral damage of our actions. And so what I said to this person when I, they presented this question to me is I said this. I said, well, you can find forgiveness, but I don't think you'll ever find peace. If you make mistakes in life and you go to God for forgiveness, you might be able to find some absolution for your wrongdoing, but you'll never actually know peace. It'll gnaw at you as long as you let it. And so again, it goes to this real core question that's up to you. It's completely up to you. What is more important to you? Getting cheap grace, cheap and quick grace, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer talks about? or true redemption, true redemption. Now again, I don't, I am, I'm really trying hard to not paint a picture of this, that this is easy, because it's not, it's absolutely not. And you're running huge risks if you try to live this way. In fact, I would argue, and all three of these have happened to me, if you decide to live this way, you decide to carry yourself in this way, you run the risk of one of these three scenarios whenever you own your collateral damage, you own the mistakes you made with other people. Number, scenario one, you could lose the relationship but keep your integrity. Now, scenario two, the relationship could get awkward and weird for a little bit, uh, but you maintain your integrity. Or scenario three, the relationship is healed, redeemed, and you keep your integrity. Anybody tracking with the constant through all of those things? At the end of the day, maybe you can find a different way. But the reason why I opt for this is because at the end of the day, I want to do right by the person, by God, and myself. Because relationships will come and go, but you got to learn how to live with yourself forever. You live in that person forever. So risk number one, if you want to pray this prayer, some of you are like, okay, um, I didn't know you guys prayed that prayer every uh, week, and so I'll probably just uh, abstain from that particular line uh, for the next couple of weeks because that sounds uh, really risky, and I don't really want to do that no more. Um, the first risk is you're going to have to be someone who owns, takes responsibility for your mistakes instead of trying to hide them all the time. But we haven't even talked about, before we close, I want to talk about the second half of that equation. We haven't even talked about the second half of what Jesus says. Forgive us as we forgive others. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive the trespasses of others. You see, friends, if you're going to pray that prayer going forward and you're going to mean what you pray, the second implication of that, the second risk to that is this. You're going to have to start today learning how to no longer keep score. You're going to have to work like hell to try to be someone who doesn't go throughout their entire life constantly keeping tally of what this person owes me and what that person owes me and what that person took from me and what that person snatched from me. You're going to have to learn how to stop playing that game. In Matthew 18, Jesus tells this parable. He talks about the danger of this. He tells this parable of a king and his servant and uh, I'm not going to read the whole story to you. I'll recap it for you. There's this, so the, the servant owes the king money. And so what the king does is the king brings the servant in and hears him out. Hears him out. And the servant pleads and says, man, I'm going through a lot. There's a lot of stuff going on. Like, this has been tough. This has been tricky. I can't pay back my debt right now. And the king does the craziest thing, what no one expects the king to do. The king forgives the servant of his debt. Now, 
what you would think would happen is that servant goes skipping out of the king's palace and saying, I got a clean bill on life. This is great. I'm going to start showing other people forgiveness and grace and compassion. I'm going to start being the most generous person in the world. But guess what? He hadn't even left the palace when he runs into a dude who owes him money. And you want to know what he does? He does not show him grace. He does not be he does not patient with him. He has them thrown in prison until that dude can pay back his debt to him. Now, the way the story unfolds is Jesus says that later, uh, this servant, the king finds out about this, this dude, um, and uh, the servant is punished. He's punished for what he did. And some biblical commentators, they like to take that and go, oh, that means hell, or that means eternal punishment, or what have you. I don't necessarily read it that way, and here's why. One of the things that I've start, started to learn about my own life and about the way in which my relationship with Jesus works, especially when I screw up, when I sin, is that so often Jesus doesn't have to punish me for my sin because oftentimes the sin is the punishment itself. Have you ever held a grudge before? You know how unbelievably miserable your life can be if you hold that grudge You hold on to that bitterness. You hold on to all that desperate desire for vengeance. That ish will eat you alive. My mentor said to me one time, he said, if all you do is walk around the earth looking for unfairness, that's all you'll find. That's all you'll see. I can't think of a more miserable way to live, can you? And friends, the reason why I know this also is because I've tried it. I tried that way. Some of you who don't know my story know this, that uh, the, the uh, sort of Reader's Digest notes are, there is someone in my life, one of my family members, who has been struggling with addiction my entire life, and as a result of that, has harmed me, has wounded me, has harmed the relationship. And so for a really, really long time, what I did was I held a grudge. I kept score of all the things, all the things that were taken from me, all the ways in which I was wronged, and I project that upon everyone else. And eventually, it led to complete and utter misery. And so what I did was I embarked upon the process of forgiveness. And those of you who are we're still getting to know each other, I believe forgiveness is a process. I want to normalize the fact that forgiveness takes time. I feel like sometimes in church world, we don't do that. It's like we just sort of say, well, if someone's so wrong, do you forgive and forget? And that's just, first of all, it's not biblical. Only God has the ability to do that. We have no ability to do that. And so true forgiveness, real forgiveness, it takes time. It's a process. My process for forgiving this family member looked like this. Number one, it took, it took years, it took years. But number one, the first thing I had to be willing to do, the first thing I had to be willing to do to move to a place of forgiveness was I had to be willing to expand the story. Whenever you've been wronged or hurt, you ever realize that sometimes your brain will tell you the most simplest black and white version of the story? Well, they did this because they're a jerk. No other details, no other extenuating circumstances. And so what I did with this person was I expanded the story. I made room for the possibility that there are more things going on in this person's life than I had the ability to know. And then number two, I hated this one. Number two, I had to open myself to empathy. I had to ask myself the very uncomfortable question, where have I maybe not done the same thing as what they did to me, but where have there been places where I've done something similar Those two steps, what they'll do is they'll give way to this third one, which in time, when you're ready, will enable you to eventually cancel the vendetta you have against this person. And for some of you, you're like, you know, I don't, I don't have a vendetta against this person. I'm not like at home plotting a plan to like hurt or harm this person. That's fine. But it also counts if you've wished or hoped harm upon them or quietly celebrated when they've gone through suffering. And maybe we all done that. 
your enemy does something wrong to you, something wrong happens to them, and you're like, <laughs> amen. And what that'll enable you to do is this fourth and final step. And friends, I want to make sure that we're clear about this too, that forgiveness does not necessitate a relationship. Jesus is clear about this. Matthew 18, when you work through the steps that he coaches you to, that you may reach a place where you have to love someone from a distance. You may not be able to have a relationship with this person on this side of heaven until Jesus himself comes back and redeems that thing. So I'll close here. Uh, it's a really risky thing to pray these words. And I want us to be a little bit more mindful of when we pray these words. God, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those. I want you and I to know the implications of the consequences of praying, of making these requests of God. Because, friends, at the core, at the core, why this prayer is so hard is because it requires the very thing that is hardest for every single one of us, which is to reach a place of acceptance. The hardest part about forgiveness is twofold. Number one, I have to be willing to accept that if I take responsibility, they might start seeing me differently. They may start seeing me as flawed, as complex, as imperfect. I have to accept the possibility that they're going to change their image of me. Furthermore, why this is so hard is because simultaneously the other thing you're signing up for is you are accepting the fact that when it comes to the punishment, the discipline, the vengeance regarding the person who has wounded you, you are accepting that this is now no longer your job. That you now no longer get a say in what kind of thing goes back at that person who harms you. You are accepting the fact, Romans 12, that vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. And you're accepting the strong possibility that the vengeance that God enacts is going to be way more compassionate, way more merciful, way more patient than you would have preferred. And so let's, be, let's just be real as we close. Let's just be real. As you're hearing this, some of you are like, yep, I don't, I don't want to do that. Mm -mm. I don't want to live in that world. I don't actually want to uh, engage that way uh, with those who have wronged me. That's fine. That's fine. But this is the only way I know. As followers of Jesus, this is the only way I know. And so if you choose to embark upon it, Know this, know this. There's a lot of people who talk about acceptance all the time, like, you should accept it, and I never know what the heck they mean. And so I thought about it some, and I was like, I think in this instance, acceptance actually requires two things of you. It requires you leaving this place and saying, okay, what things am I going to stop, and what things am I going to start? That's what your acceptance looks like. It looks like this. Maybe for you, one of the things that it's looking like for you is uh, you're going to stop gaslighting other people when you've done wrong to them. Maybe for you, you're going to stop manipulating the details of the story. Maybe for you, you're going to stop hoping for your offenders' suffering or quietly celebrating when life is going haywire for them. Maybe for you, you're going to stop punishing the present people in your life based off of how past people in your life affected you and wounded you and traumatized you. And then, additionally, you got to do both. you got to stop and you got to start. Maybe for you, what this looks like is facing hard truths, facing difficult realizations that maybe you weren't as innocent in that situation as you like to presume you were. Maybe for you, it's having brave conversations with the people that you've wounded, stepping out and saying, nah, man, like I, I'm going to own that. I've been pretending this whole time, but I did this wrong to you, and I'm taking responsibility for it. Maybe for you, it's doing an internal look and saying, I'm going to eliminate some double standards. I feel like I always like to have grace. I give myself the benefit of the doubt, but when other people do that very same thing, I hold them to a completely different standard. Maybe for you, what it is, is finally starting to believe in grace again. So my question for you today is this. It's, 
What do you need to stop? What do you need to start in order to create some peace in this world again? Here's the good news. If you're willing to work to create it, you also might just find it. This peace inside of you that you've been starving for and longing for might just finally become real. Thank you for listening to the Peak Podcast. Make sure you subscribe wherever podcasts can be found. For more information on how to get connected with our church, please visit us at thepeakchurch.org.